Welcome. Bienvenue. Bienvenido. Hoş geldiniz. Willkommen. Hallo, herzlich willkommen und danke fürs Kommen, which I believe is hello, welcome and thanks for coming in German. So, um, yes, my name is Greg Wagstaff, as Brigitte said, and welcome back to my um, presentation today on overcoming the lost learning of lockdowns. Basically, all the lost time that we've lost in education, how can we make that up over the summer? Uh, so, as Brigitte said, I'm a teacher and teacher trainer based in the south of Spain. And in addition to that as well, I'm lucky enough to be one of nine presenters for the Learn English with Cambridge YouTube channel, um, which if you haven't stopped by, please do, because there's lots of really, really great content. Um, there's lots of really, really great content on there for both teachers and students as well. So if you haven't stopped by, please come by, click subscribe, and we'll see you there. But anyway, that's enough about me. Uh, more importantly, let's move on to today's presentation. And I want to begin by clarifying something. Exactly what is lost learning? Because obviously when preparing this presentation, I did a bit of research myself and I've settled on the definition for today of lost learning, the one that I like the most. And this is something by Dr. Dylan William, who's Emirates Professor of Educational Assessment at University College London. And lost learning is one of two things. Now, the most obvious one, okay, is mislearning. Those learning opportunities that we've missed out on as a result of school closures. So those things in the syllabus that we haven't been able to teach our pupils. Secondly, as well, when I refer to lost learning today, I'm also going to be talking about something that's called forgotten knowledge. Now, this is things that perhaps you've taught your students but because of the breaks between schooling or perhaps that initially you didn't have enough time to teach your pupils and they forgot, uh, this is their, 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 how they've forgotten the knowledge that you covered initially. So when we're talking about lost learning, I'm gonna be talking about those two things, the things that they've missed and perhaps the things that they've forgotten as well. Um, and in addition to looking at combating these two things this summer, we're also going to be looking at general rustiness. You know what it's like that first lesson where you come back after September and you say something to your pupils and they look at you like you're speaking an alien language. We're going to look to combat that as well. So um, that's lost learning. And let's move on to today's talk and what I'm going to be talking about. So there's two big parts in today's talk. The first one being something I've dramatically called the plan. It's not as dramatic as it sounds, but it's simply where we're going to be thinking about what content we want our pupils to cover this summer. Okay, they might have missed out on a lot, but can we cover all of that? And what should they be covering? So we're gonna have a bit of a discussion about that. And then the second part will be giving them the skills and support and perhaps resources that they need to complete that well, complete that, uh, those parts of the curriculum that they have missed. That's what we're going to be looking at. So talking about what they need to cover, and giving them skills to be able to cover it well. Of course, there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, but first, before we get into the presentation, I would just like to do a chat box test because today's presentation is very practical. I've tried to think like a teacher and make it as real as possible. And as a result, make it practical and interactive. And I'm going to need you to interact with me through the chat box. So I know a lot of you have already, but could you please just comment in the chat box with your name and what city in Germany you're from. And if you're not from Germany, tell me where you're from anyway. So I'll just give you a few seconds, please. Just comment in the chat box. Where are you from? Ursula, you're the first. Marion from, oh, I missed that Marion. They're coming quick and thick and fast. Munich, Ansbach, Cologne. Uh, they're coming in very quick. Munich again, I saw that one. Frankfurt, of course, okay. Okay, lots, lots and lots. Fantastic. Valdeck, Sur oh, Zurich, we've got someone from Switzerland as well. Okay, fantastic. It's great to see lots of you today. And if you're watching the football tonight, I'm wishing Germany luck as well. So good luck with that. Um, let's move on now. I'm not going to begin today's presentation with words, but instead I'm going to begin with a number. Okay, so what we have here on screen is two thirds. Okay, two out of three or two thirds. I would like you please to think about today's presentation, the title of today's presentation, and think, what's the significance? What does two thirds mean in relation to today's talk, please? 
So please have a think and comment in the chat box with what, two thirds. What does that mean in relation to today's talk, please? Student, one third of our students' learning has been lost. Two thirds, um, students only remember two thirds of what we taught them. Sometimes it feels like less, unfortunately. Um, two thirds get lost, two thirds for the students forget two thirds of what they learn. Okay, this is really good. Keep them coming in. I'll give you a few more seconds, but yes, two thirds. What does that mean in relation to today's talk, please? Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the answer. Of course, I think I saw in the chat box that somebody got it correct. And what this means is that two thirds, two thirds is on average the amount of time an academic year has been lost due to COVID school closures, which is an incredible number when you think about it. It's a lot, a lot of time. And there are some countries, for example, like Kenya who are planning on repeating their whole year to catch up. There's some provinces in Canada and India that are going to have a reduced curriculum next year and focus just on them. Um, so it's a really, really big number. And so it's a really, really big thing that we have to address here. So um, how can we do that? And how can we do it effectively over this summer? First of all, let's have a look at something I've dramatically called the plan. OK, so what we're going to be looking at here is I've tried to think like a teacher. I'm a teacher first and foremost and tried to think realistically and practically. How can we get our pupils to cover what we would like them to cover in the summer? Um, so. What I would begin with, OK, is, of course, when developing this plan, you need to sit down and think what have the pupils missed or what do they need to cover again? So. Of course, a nice place to start, maybe the contents book in your um, in your course book or whatever you're working from. Um, and you're going to be thinking about, I'm not sure if you can see that too well, but of course, first of all, what did we miss? OK, what was missed in terms of our learning? And then secondly, um, one moment, what could we recap as well? OK, so those two things, those are two really, really important things, of course, the most important things. We need to take the time to sit down and think, what did we miss and what could we recap? Um, but again, I'm thinking for you guys as a teacher, I understand if there's lots of things that have been missed and need to be recapped. In this summer, can we expect our pupils to cover them all? OK, time is going to be a priority. And of course, your pupils need a break. You need a break. Everybody needs a break. It's been a really, really, really tough year for you guys. So we need to think about perhaps prioritizing those topics as well. So we think about what needs to be covered, what needs to be recapped. And of course, a nice process would be thinking about, is it necessary? Do our pupils actually know it already? Do we need to do this? Perhaps. Is it important as well? Um, course book writers might disagree with you, but some parts of English grammar, English language, are perhaps more important than others just because we use them more. They're more frequent. And a final question might be to think, is it something that's too difficult for our pupils to learn by themselves? Of course, no language is too difficult for any pupil. But when they're alone at home in the summer, is it something that's too difficult? So I'd recommend, first of all, thinking about what we want to cover and then pushing them through these filters with these questions as well. And then the final step, what I would do is pass it over to the pupils. I'm a big believer in involving pupils in their own learning and then taking responsibility for their own learning as well. Um, and I would ask them, you've been through this process, you've thought about what they might need to cover, you've thought about these questions, and then let's ask them, let's ask them what they think that they need to cover. Why are we going to do that though? Of course, to begin with, it's really motivating. We all know that in life, when we feel when we're obliged to do something, if we feel like at least we've had some input, some contribution to what um, what that is, it's mo a lot more motivating, a lot more inspiring for us as well. So we can provide motivation to pupils. 
The second one is encouraging growth and responsibility. Now, we may have pupils in a certain class in our care for a year or two years, but we're not primarily just focused on them. We want to create learners that can uh, learn throughout their lives. And so in doing this, in giving choice to our pupils, we can also encourage them to, to take responsibility for their own learning and to think, OK, what's best for me and what do I need to do in order to progress? More accurate. Now, this could be a debatable one. I'll leave it up to you to decide. But who knows the pupils best and what their strengths and weaknesses are? Of course, we have a pretty good idea, but a lot of people would argue it's the pupils themselves. So asking pupils themselves is a nice idea because potentially they know best. And then finally, thinking about this is not really to do with the benefits of giving choice, but this is more something to do with you. When you do decide to set your class, whatever you set them, are you going to set them work on an individual basis? Exactly what's right for each individual pupil? Or are you going to set it as a group as well? That's totally your decision, of course. Both have pros and cons. If you do it on an individual basis, it's more tailored to each individual. If you do it as a group, of course, it means your group's more together. And then maybe when you come back in September, you know what everybody's done. Um, that's completely up to you. But in terms of the plan and selecting content, I just want to reinforce that message that I don't think we can expect our pupils to cover everything absolutely everything. We don't have the time to do it. So prioritise and be selective and involve the pupils in that choice as well. How can we do that though? Okay, so in class, I want to get practical now. Like I said, I want to get some practical ideas out here in front of everyone. So um, involving pupils in the process, of deciding what they need to cover over the summer. I'd like to get some ideas from you. What methods or activities can we use to collect our pupils' preferences? For example, we want to know what they think they should be studying. What means, what activities can we use to do this in class? It doesn't necessarily have to be a piece of writing. It could be, perhaps be something interactive. So I'll just give you a minute or two, please, just to comment with what can we do in class? What kinds of activities can we do to collect our pupils' preferences? OK, so Anya, thank you. A questionnaire, Kahoot. A survey, ranking, Ursula, thank you. Onku, Mentimeter, I don't know what they are, but they sound like good ideas. Maybe you can give me some more details, Julia and Maria, Maria thank you. A Padlet, oh, Padlet, we're going to talk about that later. Thank you, Simon. Placemat method, Google survey. OK, I'll give you just a few more seconds. So what methods or activities can we use to collect our pupils? References, please. Okay, fantastic. So um, I've got some ideas, but most of them have already been said by you, which is fantastic. So let's have a look. So ideas in which we can give choice to our pupils is, of course, a class survey or a questionnaire. Um, what I'd recommend here, what's quite a nice idea, instead of you passing out the pieces of paper and taking them in, why don't you get pupils interviewing each other, sitting down, interviewing maybe one on one, maybe moving around as long as it's COVID friendly, of course, interviewing, interviewing each other, maybe collecting the results, maybe giving a presentation. You could really extend that activity. Ordering topics. Somebody said this, perhaps it could be as simple as a list of topics and they put a number next to them according to preference or what they find most easy or difficult. Or you could also do it with the topics on pieces of paper and then putting them in a certain order in terms of which ones are most difficult. A next activity could be a nice simple scale, of course. Imagine you've got a piece of paper. One end of the piece of paper is I'm very comfortable with this language. The other end could be I know nothing about this language. And you could ask pupils to write the topic on the scale according to that. And quite a nice twist on that, especially with younger learners and perhaps lower levels, is doing as a physical scale. So instead of that scale being on a piece of paper, perhaps it could be across a room. And you ask pupils to stand where they feel on the scale according to how comfortable they feel with the language as well. 
some people may want to set it for homework. Why do I say that? Um, because sometimes you can find, again, it's often the case with maybe younger learners or lower levels that um, pupils can copy each other. They see their friends going to this end of the scale, so they naturally follow as well. So maybe it's something that should be done for homework. Um, however you do it, I do recommend being honest. Now, I, whenever I talk about this, I do have one colleague in my head who used to do these activities with his pupils, but then used to just set them the work that he wants to set them anyway. And I think there's no real point to that. It's a bit unfair. The pupils have been open and honest with you about their weaknesses. So I think it's only fair that you're honest with them and whatever their results, whatever they deem to be necessary for them, we should listen as well. Um, so, and also maybe you want to think about materials. We've thought about the content now and we want them to cover. Think about, do you want to make photocopies? Are you going to do it electronically somehow? Are you going to give them answers? That's a genuine question. Um, of course, answers are great for feedback and for reference, knowing if you're right or wrong. Do you have the confidence in your pupils not to look at them before though? Again, that's your decision, that's a thinking point. Reference materials, where do your pupils go if they don't understand the work? And then finally, a big question, we're gonna talk about that more later, you. You as a teacher are the greatest resource that there is in a classroom. But are you available all summer? Okay, because you need a break as well. So. Um, those are things to think about with materials too. If you have a, a really good course book, a lot of good course books like Essential Grammar and Use already have these sorts of things covered. So for example, in the Essential Grammar and Use German version, you've got German translations and explanations, which you might have in your course book as well, I don't know. And also the Essential Grammar and Use is really good because of an ebook with answers as well. So the idea of um, references and answers and whether it's electronically, you can get with essential grammar and use there. One final thing as well I would like to think uh, maybe you want to think about in terms of setting your pupils challenges for the summer is something personal okay now maybe you want to set your pupils some personal targets these are just some here don't forget that I think it's really important if we can ask our pupils to set a personal target, nothing connected to the curriculum, nothing that I'm going to correct, nothing that I'm going to mark, but something for you, something purely for your enjoyment of English. Don't forget, we want to foster that as well. And I think if we're setting our pupils work over the summer that's from the curriculum, let's try and balance it a little bit with asking them simply, purely, all by themselves, what do you want from English this summer as well? So maybe setting a little personal target is a nice idea too. Okay, so um, that's the first big part of the presentation. It's, like I've said, the plan. Thinking about what are we, how are we going to set um, and what are we going to set for our pupils over this summer. In the next part of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about um, skills, support and resources that we can give to our pupils so they can complete that work, whatever it is, so they can complete it to the best of their ability. And I'm going to begin by talking about learning how to learn, the idea of developing autonomous learners, uh, autonomous learning within our pupils. So uh, I've got your next task, please. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a text, for example, this text I'm going to show you. And I would like you to read it and as quickly as possible, read it and comment in the chat box with what phrase means the same as to study the essential facts of a principle or skill. So I'm going to show you the text. You're going to read it very quickly and then comment in the chat box with the word or phrase that means the same as this, please. OK, here we go. So read it very quickly and then comment with which phrase means the same as to study the essential facts. Oh, we have a winner. OK, I'm not going to say it, but we have a winner already. Fantastic. OK. OK, I'll give you a few more seconds. It's a very good sign that you're saying the right answer, of course. That must be it's right. OK, let's have a look, shall we? 
Okay, which phrase means the same? Of course, it is to learn the basics. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's do another one. What phrase means the same? Maybe you know this. Maybe you can remember this already. Which phrase means the same as to take a test? So who's going to be the first? Oh, we've got another winner. And we've got all the same answer, which again, like I said, is a really, really good sign. Wow, wow. Claudia, Karen, Melanie, Ines, uh, Anya, Helga, Suzanne, Angelica. Right, okay. Okay, fantastic. It's very clear. You're very good at this. Okay. And of course, what means the same is to take a test, and that's sitting an exam. One more. Which phrase means the same as to get into a school? Someone, Alina's typing already. She probably can remember from previously. Please comment. What do you think? This one's a bit different, please. Remember the phrase from the text as well. What phrase from the text? I have, of course, helped you a little bit by highlighting it. Okay, so let's have a look as well. Of course, the highlighted phrase there was to gain admission. Of course, you can enter a school as well, like a lot of you commented, but to gain admission. So uh, this is a little activity we did, and it's something called a book race. Now, a book race is really, really good because it helps encourage our pupils to notice language. Yes, Karen, yeah, enter, enter is in the text as well, and enter is correct as well. Um, uh, book races are really good because they encourage noticing. Now, what noticing is, is you guys have obviously all learned English and you probably remember times in your schooling where your teacher pointed out something to you, pointed that out to you and you thought, I've never seen that before. And then the next day you see it, the next week you see it, the next month you see it, you see it all around you because somebody has pointed it out to you. You're now able to recognise it because you're able to notice it. And so that's what book races are really, really good for. They draw the pupil's attention to a particular part of language. Um, you can do this physically or digitally. Of course, we did it on, in an online setting. You can do it with physical books as well. You can highlight the language or not. Of course, again, we did that together. Some language was highlighted, some wasn't. And finally, just a little tip, give learners one life, otherwise, if they don't have one life, they just shout out the first random thing that comes into their head. So a book race. Now, a book race is an example of the first step of this learning to learn process. And that's the idea of recognising language. OK, so our pupils over the summer, they're going to be completing the work that we give to them. And we're going to teach, try and encourage this first them to have this ability to take this first step in this process. And that's recognising language. Um, I always recommend when you do an activity like this that you're very open with your pupils and you say to them, right, okay, what we've done here, we've drawn your attention and we're looking at something called collocations. Collocations are this, we have them in our language too. Um, I think all of this process is really important about being honest with our pupils because then they're more conscious of what they're doing. Ideally in chunks where possible, if you can, of course, language is best learned according, well, in my opinion anyway, to learning in chunks, that's a nice one to do. And remember, it's a transferable skill. This you can do for other parts of grammar. If you want to teach your pupils how to recognize irregular past verbs more, you can do it with the regular past verbs or idioms, you can do it there as well. Um, but what's important is that we're developing this ability to recognize certain parts of language in English. And that's the first step in something that's called three R's, the ability to recognize. What comes after is the ability to research. So our pupils, again, this summer, they're completing the work that we've set them. They notice something. They notice something they don't recognize, and they think, ah, oh, I think that's a collocation. How do we find out more information about it now? So there's various ways we could, um, there's various means we can give them to research the language. So it may be things like corpora or looking at the corpus. That's particularly good for collocations. Thesaurus, of course, dictionaries, YouTube, and Google. 
the, particularly the last two, if your pupils are studying the second conditional, for example, where best to find information about that? Google and YouTube are great. Um, but one thing I want to show you today, and it's my new favorite toy, so to speak, is something called Youglish. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard about Youglish out there, but it's a really, really good tool for self-pronunciation, for teaching, um, teaching yourself how L1 speakers say things and then being able to um, do it yourself. Ursula, thank you. Yes, you've used it before and often, and it's great, according to Ursula. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, fingers crossed it works, I'm going to show you a video, a quick video of me using Youglish. Now, um, Please, if you can't hear the video, can you please just comment in the chat box and let me know. But I'm going to play it and hopefully it should work. That looks like a no. <laughs> Let's try it one more time. Okay. Uh... Okay, it would appear that the video isn't working, but if I can just explain to you what Youglish is, and I think also in the chat box as well, I can type it in there for you as well. Um, let me explain what Youglish is. So Youglish is basically, imagine YouTube, okay? Now YouTube is of course, we can search by topic, for example, I don't know, uh, Germany football highlights. What we can do with Youglish is we can search for chunks of language. For example, something like out of the blue. We can search for this and a Youglish will bring us up loads, thousands of videos of examples of L1 speakers saying out of the blue. And the beauty of it is you can choose between American, British and Australian accents. You can fast forward. You can make the, the, um, the speech go quicker or slower. So you can test higher ability pupils or possibly make it easier for lower ability as well. Um, but it's basically an online uh, catalogue of real life examples of pronunciation. Um, you can check it out now, but probably best after the presentation. But um, it's something, it's my new favourite toy. And as Ursula said, it is a really, really great thing. And it means that our pupils can sort of um, improve their pronunciation by themselves over the summer too. So check it out if you haven't done already. Um, and things as well, like in terms of supporting our pupils, uh, in a lot of good course books, like the English Vocabulary in Use one, you also find there's definitions for certain words below, which can really support our students. A really nice feature of English Vocabulary in Use here is that you can highlight any word in the ebook and click on this button here, Definition, and there's an inbuilt dictionary. So any word that your pupil is unsure of, they can look up in a dictionary too. And this button here, what this does as well, this plays audios of the text. So again, if your pupils are not sure about how something's pronounced, they can maybe go to Youglish, or if they have English vocabulary in use, they can check it out there too as well. Um, so, moving on. What have we looked at? Our pupils now, they've looked at a piece of language, they've recognised it, okay? And they've also looked at how to research it as well. But the final step, let's not forget that we also want to tell our pupils how to record it as well. Um, that may be through sort of mind maps or collocation bubbles or, or collocation tables or anything, any of these established ways we already do it. Or you could always ask for pupils to design their own. Here's just a few examples of some of my own pupils and what they've done. Um, let me explain this one to you. This is from a private student of mine called Marie Jose. And how this works is that it's a big circle. It's collocations of put. The most frequent ones appear in the middle and the most infrequent ones appear more towards the outside. Um, it's not an exact science, but the most important thing is that it works for her and she's really proud of it. She's especially proud that I'm showing it here today, actually. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to let your pupils design their own as well. But teaching our pupils to record language, again, provide choice. We're not here to say this is exactly what you need to use. Let's provide choice to them. Chunking, try and record in chunks if you can. And then finally, is the back of their notebooks the best idea? 
or is it better? A colleague suggested to me last year, and I thought it was a really nice idea, is to get our pupils to record vocabulary throughout their notebook, because then that means they're much more likely to come across them as opposed to just seeing them in the back of their notebooks every now and again. OK, so this idea that supporting our students this summer by trying to make them a bit more autonomous. Here's a nice little process to do this. OK, it's teaching our pupils to recognise language, research it and record. Um, remember, this is a transferable universal skill and this will be a skill that will be with them forever, not just in your lessons. And it's part of that dream that we all have, of course, of making lifelong language learners. Um, it might be a nice idea if you can, if you have time. Of course, I do realise that I'm a teacher as uh, well. I understand that time's tight. But to teach them before, teach them something, or teach them how to do this rather, before summer. Songs are quite a good way of doing this to introduce them. They're often rich in language that's repeated, especially if it's in the chorus. Um, and obviously rhythm and beat is a really nice uh, way of having pupils learn things. We all know that songs and chants help us remember things as well. Um, for example, one of my favourite singers here, you can see Adele and the song Someone Like You. I've just taken a small bit of text from there and highlighted the collocations. Um, but it's really rich in language. So if you do want to introduce your pupils to this process, uh, why not do it with a song? Get them recognising language in the song, researching it and then recording it as well. So yeah, learning how to learn. We've done that in the context of collocations, but you can do that in the context of many different parts of language. That's completely up to you. The next part of the process. So we've looked at a skill we can give our pupils. Now let's think about how can they support each other specifically this summer. Um, I'm going to begin by asking you guys. Okay, now over the summer, you might be available, you might not. That's your decision. But how can we ensure that our pupils support each other, that they're communicating, that they're there for each other? Because they're going to depend on each other for a lot for support over the summer. So can you please just comment in the chat box with any ideas, any systems that you might have in place already to allow our pupils to uh, communicate with each other? Somebody's mentioned a programme already that I'm going to show, so there's a little clue for you. Learning Buddies, yes, lovely. Microsoft Teams, online conference room, Padlet again. English group via WhatsApp, fantastic. Okay, I'll give you just a few more seconds then, please. So how can we get them to communicate over the summer? Teams. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to throw some ideas at you. And there's pros and cons of these ideas. And it's completely up to you to decide what you think is best for your setting. But here's some ideas. Uh, the most obvious one is social media. OK, um, social media, it's really important to our pupils, especially the younger ones. And nowadays in the age of COVID, it's often the way that we communicate with sometimes our best friends who we can't see. So if we begin with something that probably not a social media, but I put it in here anyway, that's emails. Now, emails, the benefits of emails, of course, you can send really send really big documents through. You can share all sorts of academic information. Um, and the beauty of it is that. It doesn't get too chatty. It's not a forum in which pupils can chat too freely. If we look at the opposite, somewhere where they can chat freely are WhatsApp groups. Some of you may have class WhatsApp groups already, which is great. Some of you may not. But they're good because pupils can chat, but sometimes can become a bit too chatty. And maybe there's not the best place to share documents and whatnot. But they are potential ideas. Um, Yes, Jacqueline, yeah, I understand some pupils in school or some teachers are not allowed to have WhatsApp as well, and that's fine. I'll address that in a minute. There are certain privacy issues, but it's an option for some people, possibly. Um, OK, sorry. And then moving on, a third, possibly a third and final option, maybe perhaps in the middle, a class Facebook pages or Facebook groups. 
These are quite good because they can be quite chatty, but not too chatty. So your pupils can communicate quite easily through them. Um, and then, of course, you can also share documents too. So um, perhaps Facebook is somewhere in the middle. And also connected to this, now a couple of people have mentioned Padlet. Um, and what Google, Jamboard and Padlet are, they're basically, the best way to describe them is giant um, interactive whiteboards. And what they are, they're forums in which pupils can come and contribute their work or their resources or their link. Um, so imagine you've got a big empty whiteboard and someone posts up a link to a grammar video, someone posts up some resources, someone asks for help. Um, they're really basically big interactive whiteboards in which pupils can contribute to the work and help each other. Uh, Google Jamboard is something, it's a bit more basic. It wasn't actually designed for education, but basic's not necessarily bad, but it could be a forum uh, which could suit your pupils. I did want to show you Padlet, however, today. Now, Padlet, I do know that some people have already commented with this. Padlet, for me, is something really, really fantastic. Um, task cards. Thank you, Ursula. Apparently, a German, a German alternative or a German-based server is Task Cards, so maybe you could use that as well. Now, my video isn't going to work, but if I just describe to you what Padlet can do, like I said, it's a giant interactive whiteboard, and you can directly search on Padlet for resources. You can click on there and type into um, into the taskbar second conditional. It will search YouTube, search Google for you to post. You can post answers on there. People can post requests for help. Um, the best way to learn it simply is for you guys to go and check it out yourselves. But I'm a big fan of Padlet and it's a really, really nice way of ensuring our pupils can support each other over the summer. Now, a lot of comments have already talked about my pupils can't use this. There's privacy. And yes, there are issues around this. So I'm just going to quickly touch on these. I'm not going to say what's right or wrong for anybody today. But simply, yes, there are some issues here. So let's talk about them. Um, first of all, before you set them to buddy up, are you going to do it in class, groups or pairs? If they're in groups or pairs, are they in friendship groups? Are they in mixed level groups? Are they in same level groups? Again, that's not for me to answer, but that's definitely something you want to think about. What do you think will suit your pupils best? Privacy issues, of course, there are privacy issues. I know this is particularly important in Germany. Um, so yes, I'm aware that perhaps you can't interact with your pupils outside of school. Perhaps they're under 16, they're under 18. So please be aware that you cannot just set these up. You need to investigate privacy issues there and possibly speak to your school and see what their policy is too. Uh, next one is um, give guidelines and rules. I think this is something important too. It's very difficult for our pupils. If we say to them, right, support each other over the summer, there's a WhatsApp group, off you go. I think we need to give guidelines on how to do that, particularly as they get younger or as they're a younger pupils. So maybe things like um, checking in on their partner or their group every once a week, maybe contributing to Padlet, uh, Padlet twice a week, maybe having a particular study buddy, someone they really look after. I know someone commented on that, but it's worth thinking about giving them guidelines and rules. Do you tell the parents? Is it worth the parents knowing that there is support for their child through Padlet or through the class Facebook group? And then a big question. Are you available over the summer? Of course, you guys deserve a break. You've worked so hard. This year has been unlike any other. So are you available? That's a question that only you can answer. Of course, that means some of the let, maybe perhaps negative aspects of this is that you have so much work to do. You've done so much work. Do you want more over the summer? Again, privacy issues. Can you actually do it? On the plus side, of course, you're the greatest resource in the classroom. Providing support will help your pupils. So you want to think about these things before you make yourself available. Perhaps some sort of uh, happy mediums, if you will, some middle grounds are perhaps the idea that um, you could give fixed dates to your pupils. Perhaps you could say that I will be available by email on this day, this day and this day and nothing more. OK, managing your workload. Or perhaps if you're allowed to, of course, there's privacy issues, but if you can, temporary social media accounts, because that way you're not giving over your actual social media. 
you set up something temporary to integrate interact with your pupils over the summer and then you can delete it at the end perhaps these last two options are ways in which we can find a sort of third way if you will so in terms of supporting our pupils okay encouraging pupil relationships over summer are we available we're going to move on now on to we're going to miss this task if that's okay guys we're going to move on to digital devices and our last task of the day now what I'd like you to do is to get your mobile phone. If you don't have your mobile phone, can you get it, please? And very, very quickly, I would like you to do one thing for me. I would like you to change the language of your mobile into English. If you haven't done so already, I would like you to change your mobile, the language of your mobile, into English, please. I'll give you just a few seconds to do that. So, thank you, Anya's done it already, fantastic. Um, just change the language of your mobile into English, please. I'll give you a few more seconds, that may take a little while. Go to your sec settings, go to the language, and just change to English, please. Done, thank you. Yes, if you have done it, can you tell me? Done, please, done, done. Stephanie, Julia, fantastic. Um, done, done, Martina, done, 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 done. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you one minute. Okay, one minute, and I would like you to explore your phone, use apps, use whatever you want, and then comment in the chat box with any words that are new to you or any words that you may have forgotten as well. Um, I'd like to see who comes up with the most interesting words. I'd like to see who comes up with the most words potentially as well. Um, but please just comment in the chat box with any new words that you might find whilst using your phone. I'll give you just, like I said, about a minute to do that, please. Anything that's new to you or any words that you had forgotten as well. So maybe you want to go into your social media apps or maybe you want to go into Internet Explorer, maybe you want to go into just apps that you use regularly. Um, anything that's new or anything that you may have forgotten. You can be honest, there's obviously, people might be worried about, they didn't know all the Pokemon names, okay, fantastic. <laughs> obviously a Pokemon Go fan here. Lights climbed, okay. So any new words or perhaps phrases as well that you had learnt, uh, that you that are new to you or had forgotten. Okay, exposure notifications. That sounds like a, that's related to COVID, okay. Knocked out of the gym, okay, fantastic. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds. Any more new words or things that you had forgotten as well. Okay, so we'll move on from there. So, um, yeah, what I'm proposing that over the summer, in order to give our pupils support, let's think about the electronic devices. Now, electronic devices have a massive impact on our lives. They're arguably the most important device that we have. We spend hours and hours and hours a day on them. So let's harness their potential. Let's harness their importance. And again, I think, if we're being honest, we'll all have those pupils over the summer that probably don't do the work that we set them or don't do it very well, but they're still important to us. And a way of thinking about how we can get them engaging with English can be through electronic devices. And a simple thing like perhaps changing their English, uh, the language of the phone to English, can possibly transform, in, uh, transform them in terms of how much they interact with English over the summer. Um, you might get things, for example, examples of incidental learning, things that happen by accident, like using the operating system in English, writing in English, using apps in English as well, or possibly more active learning options, such as following social media learning English accounts, quiz platforms, 
English Learning apps and Cambridge apps. I feel like we should, yes, if we want our pupils to get the most out of this summer in learning English, of course, we're going to set them material to cover, but to keep their English ticking over, if you will, and to keep them and keep them um, from getting rusty with their English, I think a really nice way of doing that is to encourage them to use their devices in a ways in which they can learn English too. You might have some Cambridge apps, for example, dictionaries or pronouncing apps or exam apps as well, like B1 and Write and Improve. Um, and don't forget, you've got the ebooks again for the essential grammar and use. If your pupil's on a beach, if they're by the pool, if they're, if they're up a mountain or on a plane, they can still study their English with this as well. So electronic devices are really, really important, I think, in terms of keeping our pupils, um, keeping our pupils active when it comes to English. So I'm quickly going to just going to recap. I'm pretty sure I'm running a bit late here. Um, yeah, my brother learned English really well by playing World of Warcraft. That's something not to be joked at. A lot of people talk about computer games being bad for, bad for kids in general. But I mean, all of my class in Spain now, because they play a certain game, they all know the word headshot, for example. They do learn English through playing games more and more. So computer games are really, really good as well. Thank you, Christine. Um, so quickly, just to recap um, the plan, okay, deciding what we need to cover. What are we actually doing here? We don't, we probably don't have enough time for our pupils to cover everything. So how can we filter that? Is it important? Is it, is it necessarily? Is it necessary? And let's ask our pupils as well. What do they want to cover? What do they think is best for them? And then giving them skills and support and electronic resources over the summer. So teaching them a process of how to be an autonomous learner, which is here I did in the context of collocation, recognizing research and recording new vocab, making sure students and possibly you are available for each other, and making the most of their digital devices as well. So uh, a final message just before I go and take questions is this one. Don't beat yourself. Wait, that's supposed to say don't beat yourself. Oh, I'll come through again. Don't beat yourself up. OK, now what I want to do here is that. First of all, you've been really great this last year, this last 18 months has been such a difficult one. And the way education has responded to the pandemic, it's been fantastic. OK, it's been really, really difficult, but you should be really, really proud of yourselves. And today's session, you know, it's really easy for me to sit here and say these are ideas you need to do. And I'm not expecting you to do that. You, you know, you have to really think about yourselves and look after yourselves but I've made some ideas here for you and it's now up to you to decide what's best for you and your pupils over the summer because yeah you deserve a summer your pupils deserve a summer you don't want to be killing yourselves over summer and then come back in September burnt out so yeah that's my final message I suppose just relax you've been great you've done really well and the most important thing is that we try and do something this summer and try and help our pupils catch up a little bit and make it better than what it would have been prior okay so if we do nothing they're not going to do anything this summer but if we do even if it's just a little bit they're going to be a bit a little bit better than what they would have been so honestly that's a message for you guys out there just a reminder about the in use series as well a lot of the examples from the books taken today were from this series which you can find um ebook versions as well and these three books here are interactive ebooks too so uh, I think I've got about five minutes, sorry, a bit less than I expected, five minutes for questions there before I hand over to Tanya. So um, yeah, guys, any questions, please send them my way. All right, some people are typing, let's just see. It looks like it, yeah. Because I love optimism, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do mean that, honestly, it's been a really hard year for you. And I don't, I don't, I don't think teachers should be stressing about the summer too much. Will for working on grammar. Okay, oh, that, okay let's, I'll um, get, I'll answer this one here. Yeah, thank you, Marla, for your recommendation. And Simone, uh, how can we incite mot students to be motivated to catch up this summer? That's the eternal question, isn't it? Um, I, I think, well, I'm going to repeat a few of those points that I said because I think they're important. I think if we say to our pupils, this is what you're doing this summer, complete it. That's very demotivating. I think involving them, involving them in deciding um, 
what they think is best for them is something really, really motivating. Um, so ask them, involve them in the process. Of course, you can gently steer them in a certain direction, maybe, but it should come from them. I think that's motivating. And ideas like perhaps using digital devices, I think, are really, really important. A lot of our students are motivated by that so much more than a pen and paper. Um, so that could be another way of doing it as well. Setting them targets. That's something I didn't talk about today, but realistic targets. I think whole group, whole group targets are not great for some people because maybe the group's here and this pupil's here, but set targets personal to them as well. Again, ask them for their input on their targets can be motivating too. Um, let's have a look at Martina. What did she say? We adapted the curriculum, the amount of periods in the main subjects per year to catch up. Uh, people's needs time in the summer. Yeah, that, again, I want to repeat that. You do need the summer, of course. This is definitely, I'm not a presenter that's saying you need to use all of your summer for work because, yeah, that's, that's simply not practical. Um, yeah, changing the language of your digital devices. It's a very simple thing, and I don't want to be defeatist, but like I said, you will get some students who they're not really going to be too interested in the work you're setting them over summer, but let's not give up on them. How can we interact or get them interacting with their English and Changing the language of the phone is um, quite a nice way of doing that. Some students might like to read novels in English. Yeah, that's a possibility as well. Um, I think, unfortunately, that's becoming less and less. But, um, yeah, that could be a possibility. Um, if there are any more questions, guys, send them over. Um, I've got a, still got a couple more minutes. Maria here is recommending Quill for working on grammar. Do you know that? I've never heard of that. Thank you, Maria. I don't. Maybe Maria could, Maria could tell us some more information about Quill, actually. I have heard of it, but I wouldn't know what, um, what it is, actually. Any summer um, reading list? Any summer reading list? I'm not sure if you're asking me for my own personal uh, reading catalogue there or whether you should be setting your pupils their own reading lists. Um, again, I think in terms of setting it for pupils, I think that's a good idea. But ask them, of course, if you're setting them things to read, I think you might lose them. Ask them what they want to read. What are they interested about? Maybe you could recommend and steer them towards. There's lots um, of ideas, ideas too. on our website if you wanted to have a look. Cool. OK. So probably just a minute or two more for uh, the questions as well. Are the books? Yes, the books I introduce are in. Well, they they all have. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, Bridget. But all of the new series have ebooks. Yeah. Um, but things like the essential grammar and the English grammar and use they have interactive ebooks, so you can actually use them, fill in the answers, check the answers. They have a built-in dictionary. Um, so yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bridget, but well, I'm I sure think, that's right, I think it? Tanya is going to talk about that in a minute. So oh, okay. <laughs> let's hear what she's saying, though, but I agree. Mentimeter is a tool for we'll surveys. Yep. Perhaps you want to check that out, Greg. Mentimeter is something that's quite popular. In Mentimeter, I'll write that down. And what was the other one? Quill as well. I'll check that out properly. Was it Quill? Yeah, Quill. I'll get that. Mentimeter. Yeah, yeah it was. Q-U. Encore, that's and... it. Encore is the other one you didn't know. Encore, that was another one. Okay, fantastic. Thank what you. about podcasts? Uh, Christelle, what about podcasts? Creating your podcast. Yeah, I mean, if you're asking me, do we recommend them to our pupils? Of course. Yeah, they're really, really great. Um, a lot of podcasts now, as well on Spotify, you have a function, or where you're getting it from, where you can actually have the, the text come up to as well. And so that, that's really great, like, for testing pupils' You don't want them doing it all the time. I think just pure listening is good sometimes. But sometimes if they want to check, they, they definitely know what their, their, their hearing is, what they think they're hearing, then, of course, you can use that function too. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. I, okay. think, I think we have to give Tanya her five minutes. <laughs> of <laughs> course, yeah. patiently <laughs> for her turn. No worries. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thank you Greg, for another great webinar. Tanya. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for giving. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so good evening, everyone. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of our e-news series. 
So e-news um, includes title for uh, different types of uh, needs. And uh, so, for example, we have um, titles that cover grammar or um, uh, vocabulary, as Greg shows you, show, has shown you, but also collocation, pronunciation, idioms and phrasal verbs. And for the essential grammar news, so for um, the elementary, um, and for the books that cover the grammar for um, elementary to B1, to the B1 level, we also have editions in different languages. So here you have the edition in German, and that, this means that the explanation is in German. And this is great when students need to work on their own independently, especially during the summer, if you have given some uh, exercises, from some tasks, something to re review or revise from um, the essential grammar news, you know that even if they're on their own, they will be able to review the rule, complete the, the tasks without feeling lost. Um, but and one of uh, the, our most popular uh, title is, of course, uh, as, um, English Grammar News. So 1.5 million of students uh, learn, uh, they learn German, no, they don't learn German, they learn grammar um, uh, by using um, English Grammar News. And this this book is so popular for a different reason for the content and for the way it is presented and we have received so many uh, feedback positive feedback from different uh, from students and teachers of different generations different uh, age groups and um so students feel confident uh, because they know they can they can work independently everything is, is explained very easily and teachers use it all the time they have it on their side when they teach during their lessons and that is why um you you have seen it um in greg's presentation the grammar is explained very clearly very nicely and then uh the exercise page follows it and the exercises are uh, direct co um, uh, sorry correspond to the grammar explanation so they know that if they are reviewing studying something that they will have uh, an exercise there that will help them practice that. Um, but the great thing also is the ebook. So, um, and that is available for uh, the uh, grammar and vocabulary uh, titles and is available for, uh, it can be accessed on smartphones and tablets. So, the way it works is that you um, scratch the code inside the book. Make sure you scratch it, not peel it, because <laughs> that will ruin the code. Then you need to activate the code on the um, web page, uh, bookshelf.cambridge.org. And once you have activated that, then you can download it via the Bookshelf app, which is available on Google Play um, and the Apple Store. Uh, for the, uh, um, e the all the ebooks have the option of playing the audio in the explanation part, which is great. So it gives, as Greg said, the opportunity to practice listening and pronunciation. Um, for the grammar titles, so this answers your uh, question before that you had before. So the grammar titles, um, the um, ebook is interactive. This means that students can complete the activities, they can download their answers and check that immediately. So you know that they, um, the students will have the, the answers right away. For the uh, vocabulary titles, um, the ebook is not uh, interactive. However, students can highlight uh, parts, they can um, look up words, and of course, there is a nice and big note section where students can type their answers and save them. So you can check them anyway at a later stage, and everything is saved there. And then, of course, don't forget the Collect Augmented app. You can scan the page and listen to the audio, access the audio, and also the definition for the grammar words. Uh, so we recommend using e-news for uh, two different reasons, for the content and for the versatility. So the, the students, what the students um, are followed, are guided throughout the whole course book and the versatility helps them decide whether they want to use the print book or the e-book, depending on what is best for them. So um, 
this is this will be uh, one of the great tools to use during the summer. Um, so among all the other great uh, great tools that uh, Greg has shown you. So uh, sorry, I can't find my cursor. Okay. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can contact Brigitte, and she'll be able to be happy to answer your questions.